Let me start by saying it was so great to see many of you last week. And it was so great to meet many of you last week as we celebrated our third birthday as a church. Over 200 people showed up to worship, celebrate, and dream about what God is going to do next at Collective. And it was such an amazing evening. We're going to do it again on October 18th, and we hope you join us. Now, if you grew up around Washington, D.C., or you are a soccer fan, the name Freddie Adu probably brings up a lot of emotions. If you don't watch soccer, he's probably the only American soccer player you've ever heard of. Because even though he hasn't played for a top-tier team anywhere in seven years, Adu remains one of the most well-known soccer players in America. After emigrating from Ghana, he was discovered at eight years old by a local soccer coach. By 10, he was already gathering the attention of the United States Soccer Federation, aka the people who pick the players for the World Cup and the Olympics. At the time, Adu was playing against kids that were older than him and scoring goals with ease because he was simply better than everyone around him. When he was 14 years old, he signed with a major league soccer team, the DC United. In April of 2004, Adu became the youngest player ever to appear in a professional sport in the United States when he entered his first Washington uh, DC United game. Now, just to be clear, he's not just the youngest soccer player, but the youngest in all American professional sports. Later that month, he scored his first professional goal to become the youngest person to do so in MLS history. Freddie Adu was the phenom that many believed would save American soccer from irrelevance in the early 2000s. And his popularity was through the roof. He starred in a commercial for Pepsi Sierra Mist with Pele. Pele, who might actually be the greatest soccer player of all time. And after spending just a few days with Adu, Pele compared him to Mozart, a child prodigy. He signed a Nike deal for $1 million. He did a Got Milk ad. He was on the cover of Time magazine. And in 2006, he trained briefly with Manchester United, then the world's most prestigious club. From there, he was recruited to play for Team USA, and he continued to dominate. He scored 15 goals in his first 16 games for the U.S. under-17 team. Then he scored 16 more goals in 33 games for the, for the under-20s. He was unbelievable. He was great, skillful, quick. At the time, there was nobody like him. But all that changed. In 17 appearances for the senior national team from 2006 to 2011, Adu only scored twice. He was supposed to be the next Pele, but instead he became a vagabond traveling the world in search of a team where he could thrive. In the 13 years since leaving DC United, he's played for 13 other teams. Teams in Philadelphia, Salt Lake City, Portugal, France, Greece, Turkey, Serbia, Finland, Brazil, Tampa Bay, England, Norway, Holland, and Portland none of which he played for more than two years before getting cut. And most of the teams he, on, he was on, he never actually played because he was just kind of a gimmick and he was there to sell tickets and sit on the bench. And today, Adu, who is 31, coaches a youth soccer team based out of Baltimore and hasn't played for a professional team in two years. So what happened? Last year, ESPN put out an article about Adu and what he's been up to since his downfall from his soccer career. And as the writer was interviewing people who coached Adu or played with Adu to try to figure out what had happened, the same word kept getting brought up when it came to his fall from grace. Effort. Effort. Adu admits he didn't work hard on or off the field. Bob Jenkins from USA Soccer put it like this, he only worked as hard as he had to. It was a matter of habits. He never had the work rate. He never had to. Things always came easy. And that ended up being his undoing. Effort. Adu was a very talented soccer player, but he only did what was easy for him. He didn't practice as hard as everyone else. He didn't work out as hard as everyone else. He didn't try as hard as everyone else. Because when he was younger, he didn't have to. Soccer came to him naturally, but as he got older and the competition of the players around him got better, instead of doing the hard work to get better, 
Instead of taking the next steps he needed to compete at the highest level of professional soccer, he disappeared from the sport altogether. Now, it's easy to hear this story about Freddie Adu and judge him, right? He had the soccer world at his fingertips, but never put in the work needed to truly stay great. He didn't put in the effort. But we do the same thing, right? Think about your relationships. In every relationship you have, you will get to a point where you are comfortable. This can be in your marriage or your dating relationship, your friendships, whatever. And you'll get to a place where these relationships feel like they've plateaued a little bit. And so you'll have to decide, do you take the next steps your relationships need to choose vulnerability and transparency and push your relationships to the next level? Do you put in that effort? Or do you leave the relationships where they are and settle for surface level connections and surface level community? It's really easy to do this when it comes to counseling. You go a few times and have a few good conversations. You talk about the things that you're comfortable with or the problems that are so obvious that you can't avoid them. But you will get to a point where you have to decide, do I dig into the stuff that I haven't told anyone? The fears, the insecurities, the pain. Do I choose to trust this person to help me work through my brokenness? Do I take that next step? Or do I leave it the way it is and stop making appointments? All the while trying to humble brag about seeing a counselor a few times. Or how about your careers? You've been in the same job long enough that you could do it in your sleep. Do you get out of your comfort zone and ask to take the lead on a project that will stretch you and challenge you? Or maybe you don't actually like your job, but it pays the bills. Do you leave and pursue something you are passionate about, even though it's a risk? Do you take the next step in your career? Or do you choose the easy route and stay in the same role, working the same projects for the same company because it's easier? What about your faith? Because here's the truth. Following Jesus is so much easier in the first few months than it is in the years that follow. Because in the first few months, it's all new. You come to church and you love it. You are learning things about God's grace that you've never learned before. You're feeling hope and peace that you've never felt before, right? So you get baptized and you ride that spiritual high for a while. Maybe it's a few months or even a few years But at some point you realize that your faith hasn't grown and you have a choice. Do you put in the effort to take a next step? Do you join a small group so you can start to spend time every week talking about the sermon and how it impacts your life and working to apply what you have learned so you can grow? Do you join the team? Use your time and talents to help other people experience the grace that has made such a big impact on your own life. Do you take a big step forward in your faith in God by setting up giving and trusting him when he promises us that it's more blessed to give than it is to receive? Do you start a Bible study on the YouVersion app and set aside time every single day to read your Bible? Do you take your next step in your faith or do you leave it where it is because it's easier to do that than take a risk? And to be honest, I see this in church all the time. I can't even begin to tell you how many conversations I've had with people in the 11 years I've been doing ministry where someone will come up to me and say, I feel like I'm stuck in my faith. My relationship with Jesus feels flat. I don't feel like I'm growing. I think I want more from my faith. And most of the time when I have these conversations, I know what's going on. They're blaming me or their pastors or their church. But the first question I ask them is, So what are you going to do about that? What are you doing to grow in your faith, to grow in your relationship with Jesus? What next steps have you taken? What new habits have you started? What have you built into your daily rhythm over the past few months that's focused on your faith? What steps have you taken in the past year that need to go a little bit further? This is the reason why one of our values at Collective is own your growth. I can't make you grow. God is the one who sets you free. God is the one who offers salvation. God is the one who makes you grow. I can't make you grow. I wish I could. In fact, I do everything I can in my talents, my time, my wisdom, and my ability to create opportunities to help you grow in your faith, to take next steps. But I cannot make you move. Your faith is your faith, and you have to own your growth. You have to take that step. Freddie Adu played on 13 professional professional teams with some of the best players in the world and some of the best coaches in the world. And not a single one of them could figure out how to get him to try. 
to put in the effort in the weight room, to put in the effort at practice, to put in the effort watching film, to work harder. Of all the people who have an opportunity for success, he had it, but it still was going to take effort, effort that he didn't give. And because too often we sit and we wait for our faith to grow, right? We wait for our marriage to get stronger. We wait for our friendships to become more authentic. We wait for our addiction to break. We wait, right? We wait and we wait and we wait. But so much of faith requires effort and next steps. In fact, if you want to grow in any area of your life, that is 100% up to you because growth requires effort. So here's what I want to do today. I want to read back through part of the Bible story that we read last week when we celebrated our birthday. And just to catch you up in case you missed it, last week we learned about Joshua leading the Israelites into the promised land. But before they got there, they ran into the Jordan River and God did what God does. And he completely stopped the river in miraculous fashion and the whole nation of Israel made it across safely. Then Joshua and 12 men created memorials or Ebenezer's in order to remember the miracle that God had performed there. But there's a detail about this story that I want to talk about today because it's really easy to miss. So let's jump back into Joshua 3. This is how it starts with verse 1. Early the next morning, Joshua and all the Israelites left Acacia Grove and arrived at the banks of the Jordan River, where they camped before crossing. The Lord told Joshua, "'Give this command to the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant,' When you reach the banks of the Jordan River, take a few steps into the river and stop there. So the people left their camp to cross the Jordan and the priests who were carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead of them. It was harvest season and the Jordan was overflowing its banks. And so we talked about this last week, but Israel reaches the Jordan River, which is flooding. And God tells Joshua, when you're ready to cross, have the priests take a few steps into the water. That's all that God tells them, but they trust him. But as soon as the feet of the priests who were carrying the ark touched the water at the river's edge, the water above that point began backing up a great distance away in a town called Adam, which is near Zarathon. And the water below that point flowed onto the Dead Sea until the riverbed was dry. Then all the people crossed over near the town of Jericho. And this is such a cool miracle by God. And while it's easy to focus on the fact that God got them across the Jordan safely, here's what I want to point out in this story. The water didn't stop until the Israelites were in the river. Let me say that again. The water didn't stop until the Israelites were in the river. And I know this feels small, but you have to understand that this was a big step of faith for the Israelites. And not just because the riverbank was flooding and they could have died, but because of what happened a few hundred years earlier quite possibly the most famous story in Israelite history came when God split the Red Sea and they walked across safely. Check out the story in Exodus 14. And the Israelites are running from the Pharaoh in Egypt in order to escape slavery when they run into the Red Sea. Then the Lord gave these instructions to Moses. Order the Israelites to turn back and camp by at pi Hararoth between Migdol and the sea. Camp there along the shore across from Baal, Zephon. Now, I know these cities are a bit intense. They're hard to say, trust me. But just remember, the reason why these cities matter is because they are real places and the story happened at a real time with real people. So the Israelites camped there as they were told. And this kind of sounds familiar, right? The Israelites are moving as a nation and they run into a body of water. This time it's the Red Sea. And God tells Moses, who's leading them at the time, to camp out there. Then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the people to get moving. Pick up your staff and raise your hand over the sea. Divide the water so the Israelites can walk through the middle of the sea on dry ground. Then Moses raised his hand over the sea and the Lord opened up a path through the water with a strong east wind. The wind blew all that night, turning the seabed into dry land. So the people of Israel walked through the middle of the sea on dry ground with walls of water on each side. So it's Moses instead of Joshua and the Red Sea instead of the Jordan. But in both stories, God performs a miracle with the water and the Israelites walk through unharmed. God brings them to safety. I mean, minus a few details, these stories are the same. It's ants and a bug's life. 
It's deep impact in Armageddon. It's prestige and the illusionist. And while there are multiple differences in the stories, I think it's really important to point out that in the first story, they stood on the shore and God did a miracle. But in the second story, God asked them to take a few steps forward before the miracle happens. You see, God had already performed a miracle without the Israelites having to do anything. That was the Red Sea. So when it came to the Jordan, while he could have done the exact same miracle again, there's something important about the fact that God asked the Israelites to take a few steps into the water, to trust God, to show their faith in him. Right? They knew that God could stop the water completely with them just waiting with their hands in their pockets on dry land. But just like in our own faith sometimes, the Israelites had to take a few steps forward before God would do what he needed to do. So I ask you, are you waiting on the shore for God to show up in your life like he has in the past? Or are you showing God your faith by taking a few steps into the river, by taking a risk, by stepping into the unknown? Because here's the truth. Sometimes God asks us to take a step before he does the miracle, right? Before he shows up and stops the water. Sometimes God asks us for a little bit of effort. And I believe that God is asking, calling, pushing, nudging, whatever word you want to use. God is saying, take a few steps into the water this time and watch me work. And I know it's scary. I know this is different than before, but I was with you before and kept you safe. Just take a few steps and see what happens. So what next steps is God telling you to take? And listen, none of you are exempt from this question. My staff is not exempt from this question. I am not exempt from this question. A growing faith requires next steps. So what next steps is God telling you to take? What next steps in your marriage? Maybe it's counseling. Maybe it's initiating a daily Bible study with your spouse. Maybe it's making date nights a priority. How about your relationships? Call that friend you haven't talked to in a while to see how they're doing. Forgive that ex who chose to hurt you and showed no remorse. Open up about your insecurities and deepen the friendships you currently have. Initiate a new friendship. Do something nice for your neighbors. How about in your faith? Is it joining one of our small groups that we call collectives? Meet new people in a safe environment where you talk about God and faith. Choose not to go through life solo and have a community of people to go through life with. Maybe it's joining the team. You've heard Danielle mention it for the past few months and in the back of your head, you've thought about giving it a shot. Join the collective kids team and help our birth through fifth graders learn about God, a God who loves them in fun and exciting ways. Join the connections team and help guests feel welcomed and valued. Join the production team and use your skills of photography or graphics or music, whatever it is to help create an intentional and engaging worship experience. Join the media team, the breakfast team, the facilities team. Those are all real teams. Or simply join the team and ask Danielle the best place to start and she'll work with you through that. Maybe your next step is baptism. And you hear me talk about it every single week. We share videos of people who get baptized every time we celebrate someone taking that next step because it's that important. And the truth is some of you have been wrestling with this for a while. So whatever is standing in your way and causing you to be hesitant, don't let it stop you from taking that next step because we want to celebrate your decision to proclaim your faith in Jesus, just like we celebrated Amelie and Bennett last week. Just in case you weren't able to be at our third birthday bash, check it out. I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. On the confession of faith, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Listen, I know that taking a next step can be intimidating. I know that taking a next step isn't easy. I know that it will take you out of your comfort zone. I know that it can be scary. I know it's hard when you don't know anyone or if you don't even believe in yourself or understand your own value. It can be intimidating. It can be intimidating to join a small group. It can be intimidating to join the team. 
It can be intimidating to give for the first time. It can be intimidating to get baptized. It can be intimidating to open up your Bible and start reading. It can be intimidating to step up and lead a group or a team. And at Collective, we do everything we can to take away some of those fears by encouraging you in the easiest way possible just to check a box, right? To check a box on your connection card or the app online, And even though checking a box is incredibly simple, and even though we will walk you through your next step, it can still be intimidating. But check out the verses that I skipped in the earlier story about the Israelites crossing the Red Sea in Exodus 14. Right before they crossed, this is what Moses said. Moses told the people, don't be afraid. The Lord himself will fight for you. Just stay calm. God is fighting for you. He's with you. He wants what is best for you. He will not lead you astray. He loves you. He's here for you. So don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. And here's the deal. Of all the things we've celebrated over the past week as a church, the 20 baptisms in the past year, the 90 plus people who joined the team or are collective in the past year, the food that was collective, the money that's been given away, all of those things started as next steps. And God did what he does and he turned them into life change. So as we move into the next chapter of collective, I want to challenge you to take your next step and watch as God works in your life and as God does immeasurably more than you can ask or imagine. And who knows, maybe next year we will be celebrating this as the day when more people took a next step than ever before in the history of our church. It's time to put our feet in the water and watch God work. Let's pray. God, thank you so much um, that you push us. God, that you show up in our life like you did with the Israelites at the Red Sea when we're still on the shore and not sure what's going on. And God, you show up and you'll lead us to safety. But God, that there are other times in our life when you ask us to take a few steps forward to be courageous, to trust you, to rest on the promises that you've given us and the hope that you've given us. So God, I pray as a church, as we've, we've seen you split the Red Sea, we've experienced that in this church, we've experienced that in our lives, God, we believe you are asking us to take a few steps into the water so you can do what you do best. God, that you can heal lives, restore marriages, help us grow closer to you. So God, we pray for that. God, I pray for every single person watching today um, that is afraid to take a next step or it's just intimidating. God, that they know that we're here for them. God, that you're here for them. And God, I pray that we get to celebrate some next steps next week. People who took a risk, people who took a few steps forward, not knowing what it's going to be like. And God, we pray that you show up in their lives in ways they've never imagined. So God, help us have the courage to do that. Help us have the courage to grow in our faith, to choose to grow in our faith and to choose to take next steps. And God, no matter how scary it is, help us know that you're with us. God, that you love us and that you're here for us. God, we love you and pray these things in your name. Amen.